Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of NASA Space Flight Live. Thanks for sticking with us for a little bit of delay. We wanted to give some time to the folks in Boca Chica to finish moving their super heavy booster. That booster is actually being set down on the stand now, so we went ahead and spooled up NSF Live because we've got a special guest this week, Mr. John Snapkraus. Is that where I put the call sign? I don't know how that's yeah. exactly going to work. John, how you doing? I'm good, and, and you had it in the right spot. Uh, I am great, excited to talk about Inspiration4. Yeah, we want to talk all about Inspiration4 and everything since we've got you here. We've also got Mr. Chris Gebhardt, Assistant Managing Editor of NASA Space Flight. Chris, thanks for hanging out with us today. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Would not have missed this one. Yeah, and thanks everyone for tuning in. As always, with every NSF Live episode, we want to do question and answers. So if you've got a question, throw it in the chat, tag us at NASA Space Flight. We'll take those over the course of the broadcast. Feel free to ask anything about Inspiration4, because we've got John here to talk mostly about that. And uh, yeah, let's just dive right in with, uh, first of all, let's just talk, how did you even get involved as the campaign photographer for Inspiration4? Mm -hmm. Tell us all about it. Yeah, so I think it was the first day of February. Um, this kind of random announcement came out that there was going to be this Crew Dragon mission that wasn't going to be a space station mission. And then a couple hours later, there was a press conference with Jared Isaacman, who ended up being the commander of the mission. Uh, him and Elon Musk and some others from SpaceX, I think, um, just announced this free flyer mission and and what it was going to entail. And and part of that with with how I got involved was Jared Isaacman. Jared Isaacman's Shift for Shop platform did a contest to find an entrepreneur who could share their story and, and hopefully win a seat on the flight. And, and as soon as I heard this, like I instantly knew that I was going to be involved in some capacity. And, and obviously my first thought wasn't, I want to take pictures of the four people. I, I wanted to be one of those four people. So I was down in Starbase at the time for, for Starship SNI. And um, it, it's, it's interesting. So that night, I think it, there was a long week of a lot of late sunsets, moonrises, and just, I was a little burnt out from all these scrubs. So I, I decided to stay in and I didn't go out for the sunset that night. And, and because of that, I was able to kind of launch my campaign, like literally in the first hours after this announcement. And I did a limited run of signed prints to benefit St. Jude. Jude. And, and, and that all eventually led to like a, a video about my work and raising almost 10 grand for St. Jude. And um, to kind of sum it up, I ultimately did not win the seat that went to my my now really good friend, Dr. Cyan Proctor, who ended up being the mission pilot. But, you know, a few weeks later, uh, early March, I got an email from the I-4 mission manager. His name's Scott Botit. His call sign is KID. He really wants you to call him KID, so I'm just going to call him <laughs> KID. I learned that pretty quickly. And, and he said... Um, you know, I, I forgot the exact email, but it's very short. It's like, hey, um, would you be willing to discuss an opportunity with us? And at this point, early into March, um, oh, people saying, Did you already know that? that they had oh. selected like the astronauts? So like you yeah. knew it wasn't that? So, so, so that's what I was going to say is I had started to hear chatter that the finalists at the very least were contacted. So I had a pretty good feeling I wasn't a finalist. So by right. the time I got this email, I'm like, okay, it's pretty obvious what they're going to want me to do. And <laughs> and we hopped on a phone call that night and um, that's what it was. So, you know, Kid and I are on this phone call for like two minutes and out of nowhere, he's like, oh yeah, Jared's hopping on. And I had no clue Jared was going to be on this call. And, and Jared and I hit it off pretty quickly. Like, I think most of that phone call, we kind of just talked about Starship and uh, just SpaceX and everything and a little bit of my work. And it just didn't really feel like an interview. It was just a couple of people talking about a, a cool opportunity. And, you know, by the end of the end of that week, like I was doing onboarding paperwork and, and getting ready to, to join the campaign. So like, like seriously, like even when Jared, when he was like, Oh yeah, Jared's hopping on, like you, you there wasn't a part of your brain that went maybe after that point, or was it really like, you know, nah, I, you I, didn't think I don't want to say yes or no, because I, I really don't remember to, to answer in enough detail, but I, the, the info I was hearing, I was pretty sure that I would have already known if I was going to be on the seat. 
Um, gotcha. And I think even so, like the second thing Jared said, call was like, hey man, like not to get your hopes up, but like you all, you <laughs> didn't win the seat or, or something <laughs> like that. And like, it was totally fine. And then, um, but, but a funny part of this is um, as a part of my campaign to fly on this mission with the print sales uh, for Jared's company actually bought, I think like five of my prints. And when I sent them to shift four, they were addressed to Jared. Like when they ordered them, they put Jared's name. So I'm like, this would be a great opportunity to just leave a little personal note and say like, even if I don't fly on the mission, I would love to come on as the mission's photographer. And during that phone call with Jared, I'm like, oh, you must've got my note, right? And he actually hadn't yet gotten the package. <laughs> so he and his team on their own accord had the idea to bring me on as the photographer. And, and he hadn't That's yet cool. seen that note where I said, can I be the photographer? So I think <laughs> oh. like fate just kind of works out. And, um, you know, like I said, started like jo joining the team that week. And then by the end of March, the, the crew came to Kennedy Space Center for their announcement where they announced the full crew and they met for the first time and they jumped right into training like the same week we flew up to Pennsylvania and they did the centrifuge training. Yeah, that was really cool. And of course, got to mention the the documentary series that's on Netflix that shows a bunch of this. That was all really cool to see. Um, and uh, we do have some questions. Like, like I said, Q&A, if you got questions for John or for any of us, but mostly John, uh, tag us with chat at SS Space, tag us in chat at SS Space Flight. Uh, and the first question is, did you, John, did you go on any of the physical training tests yourself, such as the centrifuge or the vomit comet, stuff like that? So, so none of the like official sanctioned training like by SpaceX I participated in, but Jared did arrange like external training opportunities. So there was a, a Mount Rainier climb, there was a space camp visit where they did a bit of like six axis spinning, they did a zero G flight, and then they did fighter jet training. And a lot of that I did get to partake in. And what was great was walking into this job, like as cool as I instantly saw Jared was, I was very like cognizant of the fact like this is human space flight, they got to do their thing and I'm going to be lucky. Like maybe I get to know the crew a little, maybe I show up and take a few pictures, but they basically like brought me in on the team right away. And I, I pretty much traveled with them, you know, virtually everywhere for the training. Um, and, and they were really nice enough to let me like do some of the things, not just photograph them. So, you know, they didn't say like, yeah, stand by the hangar and take pictures of us flying in the jets. They let me fly in the jets with them. Um, they didn't make me like photograph them getting on the zero G plane, waving goodbye. You know, I, I did the zero G flight with them. And and that's just a testament to the way Jared really tries to get everyone involved, whether it's his crew just motivating them or or the team, you know, that I'm a part of. And and there's been people that have reached out to Jared and like he invited them to this flashdown party, you know, cancer survivors from St. Jude, just fans of the mission. And it, it again, it's really a testament to how Jared tries to inspire people through this mission. Well, it, but and 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 I think like it's to me exactly that, right? I mean, like part part of this making space for everyone, right, is bringing bringing people who haven't gotten to go before into it, right? Mm -hmm. Which which was the biggest part of this mission, sharing it in ways that were were very accessible. Like, I mean, for the first time, like mm -hmm. watching some of the videos that they released from this, like. Oh, they're using their iPhones. Like, well, I could totally take that picture, like, out right. of the out of the cupola. But like, John, you hand me one of your mm -hmm. gigantic cameras, and I'm like, ah, how do you turn it on? <laughs> um, <laughs> but 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 that type of like, you know, when people reach out and when people just want to be a part of something positive, bringing them into that and allowing them to be a part of that is a huge part of what makes this industry incredible. Yeah, That's I think this picture, has been like way. one of the most relatable and seemingly attainable missions in a long time, if not ever, because, um, you know, these people are ordinary in, in like a good way. They're you and me, but also they're they're doing extraordinary things. And I think all of them have their own ways that make them feel relatable to the to the everyday person. Um, you know, when when we look at mass astronauts with fire missions and, and me really diving into photography and, and watching like Bob and Doug launch last year, like, you know, it's very clear, like these are humans and they have families, but there's this sort of aura of like, oh, they're test pilots. I can't do this. Um, I get nervous to talk to them. But these four are like, and, and it's hard for me having become such good friends with them over six months to say this, but like, I feel like anyone could walk up to any four of these people and just have a very nice conversation. And that says a lot about them. And it says a lot about how relatable they are to everyone. Totally. I briefly met uh, Cyan in Boca Chica, actually, while I was there, because she just happened to be there 
kind of on break from training. She was super nice, and I have no trouble believing that applies to all four of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when, when you when you were saying uh, it's John, I'm I, I'm very curious because I know there's there's so much we want to talk about, and I know we're probably just going to have to jump around on the timeline here as like questions. That's come fine, in, and that's, that's uh, across this mission because there, there there was a moment on launch day that, and Thomas can attest to this, that really got me, and it was not a moment that has ever gotten me in spaceflight before, and it was when Haley and Cyan were on the crew access arm level. And they put their arms around each other and they started to walk down that arm. And I'm tearing up now. That got me on launch day. Like we have never seen that type of moment in in, mm-hmm. in space flight before. And I, that was a real moment of when it hit me of like, wait a minute, it's not just that regular people like you like me you know can go now or have the opportunities to go it's you get to go with your friends and you get to have that incredible mm-hmm. yeah. experience that that's the moment that got me what's the moment throughout what's the moment that really got you and i don't just mean necessarily launch day like throughout all of it what's mm-hmm. the moment that really got you you know you know personally i i not even professional. I really struggle with like contextualizing what I'm doing. And it really takes concerted thought to be like, wow, like you're in a fighter jet right now. Like, like stuff like that. I really have to make myself realize like you're with the inspiration for crew over a fighter jet or in a fighter jet over Montana. But at the same time, like I'm also working. So as much as I love these people, this was not like, Hey, John, come hang out. Ultimately I was there to take photos. So, you know, it, it sucks to not give you like a very specific answer, but there's been many times where I'm just like, wow, like this is really cool. But, but the, the first time I think it really, really hit me that this was about to happen was on dry dress day when we do a full launch rehearsal and we're in the suit up room and, and uh, there's a song blasting on Jared's playlist that they released. And um, Jared's in his suit and he's just kind of walking around in a short interim between, you know, suit up to walk out. And, and for me, this was the first time I had seen them in their spacesuits with my own eyes. So, so for some context, um, you know, I got remarkable access from the campaign and ultimately SpaceX for the launch. And, and I'm so thankful for it. But, but one of the main things that I did not photograph was a lot of the hot porn activities because there's just a lot going on there. It's very dynamic. There's some sensitive you know, you never know what hardware is going to show up. So, so I got to see some of Hawthorne, but the weeks I was in Hawthorne, I was never able to see them or photograph them in their suits. So seeing Jared in his space suit, and like, this is just someone that like I've become friends with in the last five and a half, six months to be like, whoa, like you're, you're Bob, you're Doug, like you're that guy, like you're going, you're, you're wearing a space suit. And he's like, kind of not into his rock music. I'm like, wow. Like, this is going to happen in two or three days. Um, and, and that was probably like the biggest one. And then during launch, I, I took some photos of the initial ascent and I knew I'd have a little window between like um, the ascent and then like where it does the plume jellyfish stuff. And I kind of just stood there like this. And I thought all the work of the last six months, like every early morning flight, all the editing, all the back and forth on approvals with whomever, it was all for like this two and a half minutes or, or I guess 10 to 12 because they're, they're going all the way to orbit. But, but for me, like it all led up to like this. Every time that I was exhausted after a shoot, every time that I saw the crew exhausted after a long day of training, it was for that moment. And that kind of hit me. And then I'm like, oh, crap, I have to like take photos of the second stage <laughs> doing its sunlight thing. Um, but I'm really glad I got a moment during the, the big moment to take kind of take it all in yeah that's good uh just pointing out the the michael art thank you for that Finn, michael and note and comment <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm going to keep going into yeah. some questions here uh and also some some super chat questions as well all right well the first all right i'm just going to get the joke out of the way so we can address it uh sorry but only michael is verified so only his opinion matters all right yeah we get it guys <laughs> no one else here has I got know. their blue check mark yet <laughs> Um, another question for John, was there a backup crew for inspiration for it that he knows of? And if so, was he on it? Um, your, your like videos kind of speeding up over yourself. I think it's like a technical thing. Could you repeat the question? 
Oh, oh no. Oh, no they were just like asking lag. if you were on the Inspiration4 backup crew, if that was even a thing. Got it. Um, to my knowledge, there was no official sanctioned long-term backup member of the crew, and it was definitely not me, and I can <laughs> unequivocally say that there were no conversations about me serving as a backup crew member. And I think it's safe to say, um, you know, I'm not sure if this is 100% been said publicly, but I'm sure it's fine to say is I'm pretty sure they would have flown with three before they brought in someone else. Mm, yeah. Or just delayed the flight so that the whatever the fourth person was, was de dealing with. De depending, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, it was definitely not going to be me. <laughs> here's a good one. We were just showing you in the suit. Did you get the Did you get to keep the ninja suit, the SpaceX ninja suit? <laughs> No, I, I had to give it back, and they they were pretty quick on that, so I gave it back. <laughs> um, but I will say the the boots, they're, I don't even know what to call them if they're like a hybrid boot sneaker thing, but they're really comfortable, and I definitely need to order them. Like That's on my long list of things to catch up on because I'm going to be doing some more flying for sure, and it's like a great kind of flight suit boot. Nice. Nice. Uh, I'll keep – got some more questions here. Um, let's see. Eric asking, I noticed a lot of people on Twitter asking about the toilet facilities. So without getting into too many gritty details, any comments on that? Uh, I don't have anything beyond like what SpaceX and or the crew have said. Um, you know, to my understanding, like there were some minor issues. It sounds like it was never a safety concern or like, you know, a, a super critical issue. But, you know, part of this kind of training that that makes these guys different from from the other, you know, up and down space flights is, you know, they're going up for three days. And they're trained for a lot of contingencies like this. And their their lives for the past six months have been overwhelmingly dedicated to addressing these kind of things. So whatever happened, I don't know exactly what it was. I'm, I'm sure they addressed it. And I'm also sure SpaceX will use this flight and use that data to make a better system, right? Um, that's kind of how SpaceX does it. And, you know, I'm sure they'll fix it. I also get the impression that this mission was very different for as... It was only three days, so there's different requirements for what systems need to be in what operating condition and all that stuff. Like, it's definitely not a safety concern, just something that we should address because a lot of people were asking about it, and it's a little funny to talk about because voice toilets. But, you know. Also, this photo is, like, the coolest thing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I was honored to be, like, a, a guest ninja, a um, guest, <laughs> like, closeout team, I guess. You know, obviously I was not operation or mission critical, but SpaceX was very kind to entrust me with the access to, you know, be with the crew from when we left our housing quarters. So I actually, I haven't addressed this yet, but like for the week and a half leading up to the launch, like I was living with the crew and their families because I was quarantining as well, um, which, which allowed me to be there for a moment like this. So from, you know, leaving the housing to Hangar X walk out, to suit up to the pad. That's where I was able to be on launch day. And and when they went up the tower, that's where my access ended. Um, just from like, a, I think a number standpoint, it's it's really tricky to to get up there. And, you know, then I went to the VAB roof and, and got some great pictures of launch. But but you're right, there's this moment that, that Jared and I shared where we got the fist bump and pretty cool. Uh, a couple more questions about the training thing and then we'll kind of move on closer to launch and stuff like that. Um, and I'll, I'll open this to John first. A question asking, do you think people will be able to fly a craft like Dragon without six months of training in the not-too-distant future, just getting on as a passenger like you would an airline flight? Um, you know, ultimately, defer to SpaceX on, like, a real answer for that. But based off what I've seen through this mission, like, I would assume they want to get that down a little bit, right, if they're going to be doing more free flyer flights, with it, which they've already talked about. You know, Benji Reed said that the night of Splashdown, that, that the demand for more free flight missions is, is high. So I would I would assume from like a business case, you want to shrink down that training while still making sure they're prepared. I think where we're going to see the airline level of of like re repeatability and, and very quick ingress and egress is going to be with Starship, right? Like that's the ultimate plan with Starship is maybe maybe there's like an hour brief before your flight and then you like right. put on a pressure suit, if that, and then you just, you go to space, right? And there's like an automated system or pilots on board that, that will uh, steer the craft. But, but with Dragon, I'm not sure if they'll get there just because Dragon, you know, fundamentally was designed to be a transport to and from the space station. So there's right. a lot of, there's, there's just a lot that goes into that, even for a free fly mission. So, I mean, we'll see. It's exciting times. This Another, is a great go, photo. Was this, the, was this the Mount Rainier? 
Um, it was. And, and what's great about the Rainier thing is that like, I didn't have to do it. So they, they walked <laughs> away into the fog and I went back to the hotel. <laughs> um, so, so they actually, you know, I, I will say this and like, it's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to admit this, but like, they did ask me to climb. I, I did have the opportunity to climb and to climb. And I, I turned it down because I, I know where I'm at, like physically. And I did not want to inhibit their efforts to climb the mountain. Like I will be the first to admit that I am not in a physical shape right now, at least I'd, I'd like to be, um, to, to do that, especially in that weather on top of working it and trying to get photos of them. Um, so, so for the sake of like not bogging people down, I ultimately didn't climb. So they, I photographed them leaving. The conditions were awful, like awful. You know, two minutes later, they were gone. There's another photo. I don't know if you have it right on hand, but like where they're just little foggy specks. Um, but I went back to the hotel, hung out with some of the people. We we went around the park a little bit. Um, and then like two days later, photographed them coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way to go the, the, about it. You, you know that that was a good trip if the most exhausting thing for me was the red eye flight back. <laughs> <laughs> like not not climbing the mountain. But um, I, I will use this to plug the Netflix documentary, um, the, the Time Studios production, which is airing on Netflix. Um, the third episode goes into great detail about the Rainier climb, and it, and it really speaks there to Jared is. kind of implementing his own training regimen on top of the SpaceX stuff. So this was an opportunity, as Jared said, to get uncomfortable or get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Because mm -hmm. when you're in a spacecraft and it's, it's comparable to climbing up a mountain. Like there's, there's not really turning back when you're going uphill on a Falcon. So, so they had to like press forward through this, you know, these crappy conditions and, and make it to their summit or their, their camp. Um, so it was just great that like Jared implemented these kind of external training activities, I think. Well, cause that's, that's one of the things, right? I mean, like it's, it's not just about going, it's about making sure that the people you're going with are people that you can are legitimately friends with can legitimately get along yeah. with are, are yeah. not going to like rub each other the wrong way where like on day two you're mm -hmm. like open this hatch and get me home you know <laughs> yep. like yep. Oh, so, I, I, let me rephrase that after they're back like open that <laughs> yes. hatch and yeah. get me home i didn't i didn't mean the bad way that, that came <laughs> nothing out. too oh, dramatic yeah. <laughs> nothing too dramatic no like in the ocean <laughs> um there's a no, but because, because funny that, that's that. a big thing right like some people just don't get along with one another so you need to know that yeah. early yeah every everything i've heard post-flight like they got along great you know i i yeah. watched them become strangers crewmates astronauts and most importantly friends through this past six months but like even me and my friends will will butt heads sometimes if we like hang out too long so i was i was you know maybe they'll clip this and they'll tag them and they'll see that i said this but i was like kind of half expecting maybe like you know, day two, do this. No, I'm taught, you know, I, but it sounds like they all got along really well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my take on that is like, they're all mature enough people. Like I think any reasonable person would, would get in a position where they feel themselves kind of getting a little angry and go, all right, I'm in space. I'm going to breathe for a second before I say something angry. Right. And, and maybe that happened, maybe it didn't, but, but again, everything I've heard is that they, they got along great. Yeah. And uh, right, right on cue, another question about the training, and then we can move forward a little bit. Um, asking about some of these shots in the zero G flight. Asking, well, first of all, we know, so you know, you're there. Someone was asking, was that a fixed shot, or were you also floating and taking these photos? Like, how how was that? Oh, I was floating. I was floating. So, so this is a good <laughs> opportunity to talk about like the technical challenges with this mission for me from a yeah. photo standpoint. Um, this was the hardest photo shoot I've ever done. So the reason being is that cabin is way dimmer than it looks. It is not as bright as this photo make it, makes it look. And the camera settings you have to use, like you have to use a very high ISO, which is your sensitivity to light to make up for that. But also you have to use a quick enough shutter speed because they are moving. And it's also a problem to focus because all four of those people are moving on their own independent planes. They don't care if I'm trying to take a picture of them. They're trying to have fun, right? I wasn't going to be like, I want a good picture of you on this flight. I was, I was like, have fun. I'll do my best to get good pictures. The other thing is me and my camera are also moving on a different plane. So when you focus, but you're moving, your camera is like losing focus on them. So it's just constantly trying to get them sharp and whatnot. And, and in the moment that day, I was like, oh man, I don't really think I got 
that great of stuff. But since we've kind of come down from that, um, I realized like I, I did a pretty good job considering that I'd never done that before. And I think I got maybe, you know, 10 or so photos that have kind of stuck out from that day um, that have since been used and we published. Well, you know, the one that's a big out. fan of the, the, the show and the Shaka on some of these He's photos. A huge Shaka guy, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, to me, John, the 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 one that was most memorable from from that day is the one of with, where you're in it with them. Um, yeah, there's there's one that the zero G photographer took from from the company, and like I'm just like turning around with my camera, like absolutely giddy. Um, so. That was fun. When that was fun. You, so, I mean, of the three of us, you're the only one who's experienced weightlessness. Uh, so, uh, what was it like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's cool. So, I'm I'm glad you asked me now. So, I actually got to do it for the second time on the first full day of their mission last week. So, so Jared and the team had a great idea of, well, let's book the same zero G flight company as if there's 10 of them, I think there's one, but let's book the zero G guys to do flights for the family so that they can experience what we're experiencing while we're on orbit. So um, re real quick before I get into the flight itself, I actually initially had two seats for this flight and I was taking my mom on the flight. And then the team came to me and said, hey, you're gonna have to cut one because of space. So I ended up giving it to my mom because I had already done it before and I wanted her to get to experience it with the team who she had already met because we brought it out to Bozeman for the jet training. So I wanted her to get to do it. But then that morning, I'm like, surely like someone's really hung over from celebrating the night before something <laughs> and someone dropped out. So I, I started texting like the team and they got me connected with the zero G team. And, and long story short, I ended up getting to go, which was amazing because I got to share that experience with my mom is an experience that I'm surely going to, feel one day in space and I wanted her to get to get to feel that. So so this second flight, I wasn't working it. I didn't bring a, a fancy big Nikon camera. I just brought a GoPro Max, which is a 360 camera. And I spent like the whole flight like throwing it at people and, and like holding it and flying. And it was so fun to just get to like experience it versus work it. And what one thing I'll say is like uh, they tell you don't swim. So you come out of the pole on the parabola in the plane and you just start feeling zero G and everyone is, their instinct is like kick off and just start swimming. But there's no like medium that you can swim in. So you just flail around. And I did this my first time, but I was much better about uh, not doing it my second time. And uh, oh, here we, we have some pictures. Um, so astronaut Scott Perizinski Scott. was on the flight with us. He's a he's a fan of Cyan Proctor. And, and this is a guy who has done five space shuttle flights all of which launched on their first attempt, he told me, which is remarkable <laughs> with how the shuttle was. And he's done seven spacewalks. The There's one, our shuttle the reference for the stream, by the way. Okay, there continue. We go. There we go. The, the two oh, yeah, things he's, that we have in common. He's an impressive spacewalker, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's, he's incredible. So, so we have like very few things in common. We're both guys. We both have hair. We're both wearing flight suits in this picture. But the most relevant point is that we've both experienced zero G before this flight. So of everyone on this flight, other than like the staff that work every flight, it was him and I who had experienced zero G before. So we kind of bonded over that. And, you know, during like the polls, when you're experiencing two G's and everyone's laying on their back because they don't want to vomit, like we're like sitting up chilling, I think even standing up some of the time and like just having fun. And, and he, he, one thing I will shout him out on, and I, I said this on Twitter, but I'll say it again, is he spent the entire flight making sure other people had a fun time. He spun us, he took videos of us, we were throwing the GoPro back and forth, he, he spun my mom around. I mean, he really dedicated this experience to making sure others made the best of it. And it was so great to have that like mentor there, making sure we all had a good time. Um, That's awesome. So, so as for more of like what weightlessness feels like, um, imagine like you're in a pool without the sinking feeling and without the viscous nature of like the medium of water making it hard to move. So if you, actually I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to mention this real quick, but uh, if you oh, push yeah. off like, oh, a, yeah. an item or, or a wall, you, you just like instantly start moving. And like, because of inertia, you just, you just go. Like <laughs> you don't, you don't have to jump. You just, 
go. There's like nothing. Um, so, you know, like I, like I alluded to earlier, it's like, I really struggle at kind of contextualizing the things I do, but like, this was really cool to get to do because where else are you going to experience this right space? Um, and I'm, I'm not quite there yet. I'm sure I, I will be one day, but like, this is the next best thing. Um, and I'm, I'm so lucky to be a part of it. I want to keep going with some questions and stuff. Uh, we also got some super chats, multi space industries as always. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, we have a super chat question from David asking, aside from a better toilet, what upgrades or amenities will the next tour dragon vehicle have? We talked about this. There was some <laughs> Starlink Wi-Fi things, you know, mm -hmm. toilet upgrades. We don't have to talk about the toilet anymore, but like Starlink in-flight Wi-Fi sounds like a cool thing that uh, they could have in dragon. I'm trying, we, we've kind of talked about this before. What do you, how do you transition from space flight with astronauts to space flight with everyday people? And part of it is like having amenities like that. I don't like, know, thoughts um, on that? Like the ability to, I don't know, watch space balls during atmospheric reentry preparation. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris did that. I thought that was pretty great. That was amazing. <laughs> Um, also, I have a, another question here for John. Uh, was it hard to get to not get emotional while taking photos of the crew during this? Um, ye, not until like launch day, um, but but at the same time, like even on launch day, like I was very in the zone on what I needed to do, and and dry dress was <laughs> we do it for a reason. <laughs> Um, and, and especially for someone that had never really been involved in an operation like that, dry dress was essential for me to be prepared to execute on launch day. Um, I, I did some things with my photography that I've never done before because of dry dress. And, and one of those things is I made, so, so after dry dress, I looked at how I processed those photos in Lightroom from the suit up room. And I made Lightroom presets for those edits based on the lighting that I could one click apply to the same suit up room photos because it's the same light. I use the same manual settings um, and it would make it so much easier to get those photos out quickly for approval. And another thing is um, I don't have it anymore. It's, it's now a photo that Chris took in space, <laughs> but um, I had like a schedule for all the day's operations. I had my seating position in the Teslas because I was in the, the third Tesla for some of those rides. And I also had settings for critical moments that I knew would be the same lighting conditions as the, as the prior day. Um, and I had that on my phone so I could reference at any time. Um, so I used the exact same camera settings for a lot of the work on launch day that I did for dry dress. Um, and that just had me really prepared. And I just went into such a tangent about photography settings that I forgot the original question. So, <laughs> well, what, we do have some people ask you about that. Well, I think we're going to circle back in a second. But it, there was asking about while you were taking all those photos, and you said, mentioned especially oh, during the launch day. Yeah. Was it? A, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't really know, and this kind of brings up a broader discussion of, and I know I keep alluding to this, like I'm struggling to contextualizing what I just witnessed, but I don't think it's really hit me that like I did this. You know, and I, I, I say that as a, I was a part of the team, but like, as a, like, I don't really yet understand that I was involved in this project. Like, I know I did it, totally aware, I'm saying, I promise. But like, when I watch the, the webcast replay, and I did last night, I'm like, like, I'm, I'm a part of the team that's like in those Teslas. And like, it hasn't really hit me yet. Um, but I don't really think I got too emotional on launch day, maybe like the fist bump and maybe like waving goodbye in the elevator. But um. I don't think it was till they were on orbit where I'm like, whoa, like they're not just like in the upstairs guest room. They're like, <laughs> they're, they're really higher than that. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think to, to give you like a concrete answer, the emotional moment came for me. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that. So, so you may know, like I wasn't actually on the boat for the splashdown recovery, but I was on a very tall structure uh, at the Cape trying to, trying to see out for that. Um, and I think when I heard the call out that, that the mains deployed, like that's when I'm like, they're home. It doesn't matter that I didn't see the reentry because it was cloudy, like they're home. And, mm -hmm. and that like just made me so happy, like knowing that they're home. And, and I had full faith in SpaceX to like execute the mission, but like you never know what goes wrong. Like in the grand scheme of humanity, we've only been 
doing space flight and human space flight for like a minuscule percentage of that. So there's always in the back of your mind, like what happens if something goes wrong? And, and even if it's not catastrophic, what happens if something goes wrong that like they do get out of, but then has everyone on edge, right? Um, right. So, so to just hear that call out, like that the mains deployed and like, you know, even if it takes two hours to get them onto the boat or even if whatever, they're on the ground, they're fine. Even if they're all sick, which they weren't, they were all great. They all, they all walked out under their own power. But even if they're sick, even if whatever, they are, they are on wet earth, almost, almost dry earth, but they're, they're on earth. And, and that's when it hit me like, wow, they're, they're home. So. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'll, uh, yeah, I mean, it gonna is, bring um... this. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, we, another question, this kind of ties in a little bit. Um, how does this kind of campaign, working with the Inspiration4 crew during all of this, change maybe where you're looking at for your career goals or where, where you're looking to do next? I mean, how do you, I mean, mm-hmm. you, we've seen you work on some other cool campaigns. You've worked on some really cool stuff for Astra and, and things like that. Um, but this is probably, I mean, the latest really cool campaign that you've got to work on, especially. How does that change where you're looking to do next or keep doing what I, I I, mm-hmm. something along those what do you think so so i this this is funny you mentioned this and I'll, I'll allude to an offline conversation i had with chris recently and, and we'll definitely keep the bulk of that offline but <laughs> it, it really has opened my my eyes to like looking bigger and being a part of teams for projects versus you know rushing to get my computer open on the beach after like a starlink just so i can get photos out right away it, it's really opened my eyes to like you know being on a team take it on more long form things. And, and to tie in something Jared said, I think it was uh, when they got to orbit, but you know, cause what's crazy is SpaceX reuses the rockets, right? Um, the screaming of the booster landing cut out Jared's like inspirational call out on the count on, on the audio loop. But what I heard was, um, you know, the door is just opening and many will follow or something like that. And, and to draw a parallel, I think this, this campaign really opened a door for me and I don't really know what that door is yet, but I'm going to walk through it. Um, and there's going to be some exciting projects that I work on for sure as a result of this. And, and I'll tell you more when I know more, but for now, um, um, I, I do know that as like this campaign kind of winds down, um, Jared was very kind and, you know, almost immediately indicating that he wanted me to keep helping with like some of the social stuff and, and, you know, they're going to do visits and the Netflix premiere and that kind of stuff. Um, but but he made it clear that he, he wanted me to keep keep helping and um you know being able to keep working on this um will give me the next couple months to kind of come down from this and really think about the direction of my career, maybe maybe approach my typical launch work with a little more of a casual fun attitude versus like the grind that I've been putting in for the last almost seven years. Um so I might vacation, you know, I think we, we might have some sort of like Netflix premiere event soon and then maybe a couple of visits, but like, I'd love to just travel, right? Um, I've, I've gotten to do a ton of travel and I don't want to diminish the travel that I've been doing. I've done like, um, I think 50 or 60 commercial flights this year and then 10 more fighter jet flights. So it's been a ton of travel, but it's all been like working. And, and granted, I, I'm going to disclaimer this, like it's been really fun, but I haven't been able to just like, like I want to go to the Florida Keys because it's like five hours south. It's beautiful. I'd love to just go to the Keys for a couple of days and like chill out and not feel like I have to deliver on a on a product. And and again, don't get me wrong, I, I love that, but it's a different kind of travel when you can just enjoy it. Um, you know, I've I've done stuff like I, I've already like turned off the majority of non-critical notifications on my phone, so like I don't need to hear from from every aspect of like social media now that I'm not actively looking out for like stuff for the campaign and myself. So, so, so long story short, it definitely has like reshaped the direction of my career, but I think I'm only just making that turn and it'll take the next, however long to see where it goes. That was Absolutely. way too profound of an answer. <laughs> no, that was the perfect. <laughs> no, that, that was, was great. That was an incredible answer, John. No, that, that was, 
Very well. So what you're saying is you're not going to rush to Starlink launches is what we got. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, oh, this is actually a really great story. And, and um, I, I'm glad that you guys have brought me on because this gives me a medium to like tell many of these stories that like I'm not going to make a thing out of. So, so this is funny. Um, the night. So, so two nights out from launch, but we went so late that it ended up being like technically one day before, but like two nights out the the team had like this really nice dinner and then we did a bioluminescence kayak tour and i grew up on the space coast oh, nice. so this is something that i probably should have done in my life before and even then i had only kayaked like three times ever um but we did a kayak tour with the team and you may remember that that night there was a starlink launch and you know there is there's a good amount of spacex team there um, I, I won't say who just, you know, out of their privacy, but like there's there's some prominent SpaceXers. I'm not saying we went kayaking with Elon, but there are some some SpaceXers there The the families are there. And um, some of the crew was there, too. And there's a Starlink launch while we're kayaking. And it was from Vandenberg. Sure. But it was a Starlink launch, nonetheless, from the same company that was launching this mission in like. 44 hours or something. And and even though I live on the Cape or near the near Cape Canaveral, like I still try to watch every launch, even if it's from Vandenberg. Like I didn't care. Like I'm hanging out with the coolest people, doing a really cool thing before a huge event. And like, sure, like every launch matters, right? SpaceX is, takes every launch seriously. But like, we were just kayaking. And I think like right. that kind of says where, you know, to to sum up like everyone's thoughts um, in that kayak tour in into my personal thoughts, um, like. I think I'll be okay if I miss a Starlink here or there. And and this mission taught me because I did miss a couple launches. Like you can work on really cool things at the expense of missing out things that two or three years ago you would have been bummed to miss. Um, and and I don't I don't care that if I look at like if I pull up my launch galleries page right now, like no one sees a blank gallery for those Starlink launches. They just see like the I four gallery at the top. Right. And and that's what matters to me. So. Um, I'll probably be more selective with my opportunities for sure um, for the sake of like myself and like what I professionally pursue. But, but a long winded way of saying kayak is kayaking is awesome. I'm going to get a kayak <laughs> and I uh, go kayaking. So, yeah. So you're going to kayak out to the splashdown zone next time. And that's how we'll oh, get, boy. you know, special. <laughs> oh man. I, I, I will say very craftfully that I, once I knew I wasn't going to be on the boat, uh, I did. I did consider alternate ways of going back <laughs> and it Ultimately, it was it was like a look. I, and I'll throw this out there: like SpaceX trusted me with some incredible access in in as we got closer to the launch. Like, you know, I, I'll put it lightly: like they don't they don't really do that for external people. And and a lot of it was Jared, you know, entrusted me with this, and and the customer, so to speak, made asks of SpaceX, and and right. SpaceX did their best to accommodate. And I think they they knocked it out of the park and they, they trusted me immensely. But like we, there, there were some lines drawn of like, I wasn't on the boat and no, you're not going to get another craft, another vessel, whether that be an air or boat <laughs> vessel, air or water vessel to, uh, to photograph the splashdown. So that's how I ended up trying to look from an elevated vantage point from the shore. Um, but I mean, Hey, like I got to see him come back to KSC in the grand scheme of things. Will people see my my gallery and be like, well, why why didn't you get the splashdown? Maybe I know why I couldn't do it, and I know everything else I got, and that's all that matters. But mm -hmm. this is a perfect segue to talk about this. So, oh yes, um, mm -hmm. this is my this is my i4 photographer name tag, and it goes on like my my flight suit, which I have as a part of all my flights. And and when we realized I was going to be doing so many flights with the team, they're like, you need a you need a flight suit that's yours and you also need a patch. So I, I double checked with, with SpaceX before dry dress and, and made sure that I could wear this um, because I, I knew that like the team members, like the actual SpaceX ninjas, not the guest ninja like me, um, have like a very stylized black name tag. I didn't want to go in with like something that called attention to me being there. And I'll, and I'll throw this out real quick is like, there, there is a certain aura of like, don't go on Twitter and like take selfies and say, look, I'm a ninja. Like, like you're a part of a broader team, be discreet about the opportunity. And then 
the first shot of the shoot up room on the webcast is like number 30 with the camera <laughs> so everyone started tweeting and at that point i'm like okay if people know it's me i'll, I'll acknowledge it but but anyway, I, I ended up getting permission to wear this name tag, and I, I really did want to check before doing so because you know it's it's different than the other ones, and I I didn't want to call too much attention to myself or really any attention to myself at all. So so I ended up wearing it, and I did not wear it with knowing what would happen in mind. Um, so on launch day, I'm photographing Jared, and I think I put the camera down for a second, and and he's he's super tall. I'm kind of leaning back against this table or whatever, and the boots make him even taller. And he comes up and he's like towering over me in his spacesuit. And I'm like, "You're a cool guy, but this is a little scary." And he <laughs> just goes, he just goes, "Give me that!" And he rips it off my flight suit and he says, "This is going to space." And I was like, "Whoa!" Like I don't even really think I realized in the moment what that meant. Um, and then that moment isn't on the webcast, the the Netflix documentary mm -hmm. camera was right there and i'm i don't know if that will make the doc like obviously there's so much more important stuff than him ripping a name tag off but i'm definitely going to try to snag that clip if i can um so he, so he went around the room he ripped everyone's name tags off and you can actually see this part on the webcast i don't have a timestamp, but like there's a fat stack of them and and one of the techs put it in his suit like straight up in his space suit and then um from what i saw on the webcast watching it last night um he did that with the people who were like already in the tower that weren't in the suit up room and took them to space. And then, you know, last Saturday night, we're almost a week ago from that right now. Um, you know, they, they came back on the helicopter, everyone was waiting. And, you know, obviously I, I was photographing them and gave them their space to reunite with their families because, you know, I, I befriended them, but, but their families are their family. So give them that space. And um, Jared came up to me, gave me a quick fist bump. Like, you know, he just went on like a quick little, grocery run or something like, Hey man, <laughs> like, you know, not like he just traveled a million miles or something. And then, um, he, he walks off for a second and, um, you know, he comes running back to me like 10, 20 seconds later. He's like, Oh, here, here you go, man. Here's this, here's this. He goes, and he's like, here you go snap. And I'm like, Whoa, like the, like the third thing he did back in this hangar with like the whole team was like, start giving people their, their name tags. Uh, wow. And I think, again, that just speaks so much to the way that Jared cares about bringing along those with him who can't always, you know, be on the mission, but he wants them to be on the team. And um, so this this name tag right here flew in, in Dragon. Um, I don't know the conversion to kilometers, but it flew, you know, a, a million or 1.1 <laughs> million miles over the course of three days. And um, we're going to make we're going to make some like lithos, like pictures, signed pictures with coins and patches for like a lot of people in auction and stuff. And definitely going to make one and, and put it up on the wall here with like a nice little flight flown space flown thing. Um, yeah. So every time I would go to check the dragon tracker on the SpaceX site, it would be like Australia. Every time they were over Australia, <laughs> this is a funny story. Cause I would see that I'm like, Oh my, my patch is over Australia. Cool. And very funnily enough, unrelated because I didn't, I didn't have direct communication with the crew um, while they were on orbit. But uh, they later told me is like, every time they looked at land, it was Australia. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> we're over Australia again. So like, I thought it was really funny that like, you know, the disconnect with, with lack of comms, um, accessible comms, I'll put it that way. Um, they noticed the same thing. <laughs> That's funny. Lots of trips to Australia. That's funny. Yeah. Um, some more questions and stuff. Also, I got to acknowledge this super chat message from our, our good friend uh, Michael Seely oh, says, it. "No question, just a verified statement that John is the man." <laughs> Michael, thanks for uh, thanks for the message and the support there. That's funny. Um, thanks, man. I'll text him. Yeah. And uh, Alejandro says, "If John turns off notifications, he won't see that he's been verified whenever Twitter wants to do so." <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Um, I should, I should, like, like, I'm sure there's a big overlap between the space Twitter community. And um, oh, someone said my name tag is not flight proven. I think that's the term used for reuse booster. Dude, what a buzzkill. It is flight proven. It just went to orbit. No, no. That's, it's it's definitely John. flight proven, for John, sure. Exactly. Just like the Falcon 9's level up at landing, the patch level's up at landing. So your yeah. patch is at a point one. That's, so like, funny. that's funny. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, hey, um, I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, if I'm ever fortunate enough to make it to space myself, like 
this is this is going. This is payload okay. item number one. Um, nice. So maybe, before the cameras, like, like if you can't bring any cameras, will you still bring? Them? <laughs> I'll ask you this, Thomas. If if I ever end up going to space, do you think there won't be cameras? <laughs> Fair point. Oh, he's he he corrected himself. Michael corrected himself. I'll I'll shout him out. He he meant now, not now, not not. That's fine. It's all good. Oh, oh, it's um, now flight proven. Yes. Yeah, there yeah. You go. That's okay. fine. So, so anyway, I was gonna like touch on the verify thing. Is like because there's a big overlap between space Twitter and and surely your viewers, but like, like I'm a little salty that I'm not verified. <laughs> it's, it is kind of a like a fun joke that I'm embracing. Um, I think I meet the qualifications, but at the same time, I think like it's a it's a funny little trope and i think you know communities like space twitter and whatnot thrive off that kind of joke that unites us and and i'm sad because if i ever get verified that joke hey maybe the joke will actually continue on but who knows <laughs> um so you'll need to change funny. your name to like john unverified kraus you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly um but but what's what's weird is like i i applied when it first was was released to the masses. I got denied. I don't remember the exact reason, but I applied again and it's been like two and a half months and I never got a yes or a no, which means it's pending. And they just, <laughs> yes, I see it on the screen. <laughs> but, um, but now I have a ver uh, a request pending and I can't submit another one. And they just reopened it to the masses like two days ago. And I have no way of like applying again with this newfound, like, oh, I'm the I4 photographer. Uh, that's funny. He's adding one on the screen. <laughs> uh, like, like there's, there's a lot of places where my work was used as a result of my, um, involvement with I4 and, and like, that's, that's a very small moment where like, I'm going to step back from being on the team and be like, yeah, look, my work was used in the New York times and Nat Geo, like <laughs> verify right. me. Right. But, um, hey, so, by the way, while we're on this screen, John Krause is at 68.8 thousand followers. We should get him up to 69,000 followers, everybody. Can we just let's do, do that? <laughs> if you're not following at John Krause Photos on Twitter, go and do that. Anyway, that's, um, gotta get you a plug. So we, that, that would only be 10% of the people watching right now. I would, I would assume at least 10% of these people don't follow me on Twitter. So let's, let's, let's yeah. pump those numbers up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Um, I don't know where we we're at, but um, I, I I'll just keep going. We have more about like the photography side. Um, but if if you have like pending questions, go for it, and then I can like dive into like the actual photography. Uh, well, yes. Uh, so, go ahead, Chris. I I have one for you. you. Yes. You gave some photography tips to the crew, right? Um. Oh yeah, what, I forgot that. Yeah, that's, like that's can, 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 can you can you kind of can you kind of talk about like. I, and I'm truly fascinated by both ends of this question. Like when, what was the advice you gave them and what did you mm -hmm. find didn't work that if you get the chance to do it yourself, you know, Oh, that setting didn't work. Like, or things like yeah, that. So, like, um, I'll answer your last part first and, and point out something that I haven't really discussed publicly, but is is okay for me to discuss. Um, the morning after Splashdown, our mission manager came up to me. He's like, hey, I have the camera SD card and I have their four phones. They'll be ready in a half hour. Um, good luck. And and by way of Jared, they entrusted me with managing their space media. So I had mm. the four phones and I had the camera SD card. And and I was very apprehensive about this. And I'll, I'll touch on one other part. Is like my history is as someone who's in the media. So there is a, there's an uncomfortable di dynamic of like SpaceX trusting me and, and being in the media, but we had conversations and very clear boundaries of like, you're doing this now, you, you got to understand that. So, so I was very cognizant of like, I didn't want to handle these potentially sensitive like assets from Dragon, but um, they reassured me. They're like, it's all good. Um, it, it's, it's I4 media. We just need to get it approved by SpaceX. And I led that effort. Um, and and they you know i helped back up everything i helped catalog everything you know iphone photos iphone videos and and then we got the crew back their phones and you know went through the proper approvals with spacex and whatnot and um now you're seeing space content out in the world but but in terms of like before the launch prepping them um i made a written manual and i made a video guide based on the camera that we procured so they trusted me with with identifying the flight camera 
And because I knew I'd be teaching them, I wanted them to learn on the same system that I know. So it ended up being, and I promise this isn't the actual flight camera. Um, it ended up being the Nikon Z7 II. And we, we bought like kind of a two and a half kits, uh, three bodies and two lens kits um, of this. And the first kit was immediately like sequestered and went to SpaceX as like the flight hardware kit. The other kit and a half or whatever, we divvied up into training kits and, you know, uncomfortably close to the launch in my eyes because that was the time that we did this. Um, <laughs> we got those kits in different crew members' hands and they kind of just, you know, at their discretion, obviously they have very busy training schedules that come first, but um, they just dived into it using my written materials as as a reference and, and the video guide about like, you know, this is the shutter button. This is how you change your shutter speed and all this. Um, and I helped them where needed. Um, Cyan and Chris were the, the main two that like really dived in on the photography and they both, um, they both, they both practiced with the, with the camera a lot before launch. Um, so they also talked to, I think, um, a NASA astronaut or two. Um, and they talked to a lot of NASA astronauts as a part of their preparations, but they, they did talk to some specifically about photography and, and, um, those were discussions I, I wasn't there for. So I'm not sure what, tips came out of that, but I'm sure they learned a lot. Um, so they had the Nikon, they had one Nikon and three lenses up on orbit, and they all each had their own iPhone, which I think is really cool because most of these, or any video that is clearly like high quality that you've seen released post splashdown from Inside Dragon is with an iPhone. And I wrote this earlier on Twitter, but I think it makes this feel so attainable that anyone can go up there with an iPhone and get these stunning views of Earth with like a consumer grade piece of technology. You can walk into a store and buy the exact same phone that they took some incredible imagery with. And obviously there's a little bit of a barrier of entry with going to orbit, but like, it's really cool that you don't have to put in extensive months or years of like learning how to use pro camera gear to get good stuff. Um, and as a part of my dissemination of their space content after Splashdown, I have an ongoing, document of notes on both like what they could have maybe done a little better also you know considering that their photography and their training as a whole was on a really accelerated timeline but also like subtle ways that the experience of photography in space could be better from a dragon perspective so for example maybe a um to, to my understanding there's a, a privacy curtain for the bathroom i think that's been said publicly but i also think there could be a velcro curtain to block the cupola from the interior of Dragon. Because even when you turn the Dragon lights off, sunlight is gonna shine into Dragon and you're gonna get these reflections. Now, I think you'd still get some reflections even with the curtain, but at that point, then you could bring um, a lens hood, which you can see in this photo of Chris, he is using a rubber lens hood, but in some of the photos, you still see reflections. And I think that's because they just didn't get the lens hood all the way up against the glass to really block out that reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just I took some other miscellaneous notes on like photography and space in general, because, you know, the the other part of it is not not to make it about my efforts, but like this was the first time I had ever really edited space raw photos. And and um, I have learned a lot about how I would approach that one day were I to have the opportunity. Um, and, and that was really cool to see, like, um, how how Lightroom and, and how I interpret that data to make a product an exported product and um the, the one thing i think is really cool with the iphones is like iphones always perform really well in very direct bright light but they struggle as soon as that light gets less than ideal and i definitely noticed that in in their photos but their their daytime photos of earth like i genuinely believe that if they were to have like taken the nikon taken an iphone and taken the same photo at the same settings focal length everything and cropped it so the ratio, the aspect ratios were the same and exported at the same size. I think 99% of people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Hmm. That's very So I, it has me really just, excited about the future of like consumer technology for photography in space. I had some questions in chat about like, was there challenges with like the camera hardware operating in microgravity or operating in space? Was Did you have any insight into like you had to modify the camera or do things differently than you would? on earth uh with the caveat that i did not go um i haven't heard any like huge um you know modifications they had to do from like a process standpoint i think like 
I mean, I think maybe there's like a Velcro piece attached to the camera in case they need to like secure it. And and same with the phones, but um, I don't think there are any like large procedural changes to like use of a camera. Now, now obviously like um, you're always gonna be very sensitive about packing cargo because you care about where cargo is in the spacecraft, but um, not to my knowledge, no, no large procedural changes or anything. Uh, let's see. I got some some super chats and stuff. That was a super chat asking favorite lens to use on the the camera. The camera they were talking about the Z seven two. Um, I I don't know their favorite. Um, what I do know is they had. I think I might have them here. Um, so they had a fourteen to twenty four, which is like your your really wide, and then they had a seventy to two hundred, which is going to be your tighter one, and then somewhere in here. Yep, they had a um, twenty-four to seventy, and and again, these are not these are not the flight hardware. These are just the training kits, which which I have on my possession for now. Uh, maybe get to use them a bit longer because I did use them for the launch, and they're really nice. Um, but but yeah, they had like what they call the holy trinity of lenses. So <laughs> nice. Uh, Flip with a new member. Thanks for uh, joining on. Appreciate that. And then. Uh, a question asking any tips for taking photos from the ground of dragon while it's in orbit i don't know did you attempt any of that while they were in orbit or have you done that in the past i think there was one opportunity like late an hour after they launched or, or something and then there was one the next day the next day one was cloudy um so so i did i did not what, what i will point out is like it it's a challenge to resolve the iss from the ground um, even with a really large telescope, and they were higher than the ISS, and they're obviously much smaller than the ISS. So um, some of the, the Netflix time crew was like, do you think we could be able to, like, get a really long lens and, like, throw in teleconverters or whatever? Um, no, I would I would say no without vi – oh, I just hit 69,000 on Twitter. Wow. Hey, there you wow. go. We did it. <laughs> anyway, uh, we did it. Thanks, guys. Uh, everyone on follow now. I, I did it. We're done. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I, I think seeing Dragon through a telephoto lens from the ground would be, a, and resolving detail would be near impossible. But you can definitely get like a wider, long exposure. Um, just keep in mind that like Dragon's going to be fainter than the ISS, and for this mission, it was higher. So, um, yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more. We talked a lot about a training. Um, and then getting closer to launch on launch day, what was your experience? What, you know, what were you doing? Were you, I mean, well, we only talked about a little bit about, it, but you just want to talk about where you were at various points on launch day and the launch itself. So started off, um, I, I was residing with the crew and their families. So we began there and then they left for hangar X where they had like a, and, and one thing I'll preface this with is like, the reason I'm saying these things are because we've posted photos or other people have talked about them. Right. So, so for something as sensitive as launch day, like I'm only going to relay what's out there, but, um, uh, they started off at their, their residence. They went to hangar X, which you're seeing here. They took their Teslas to the 39, a suit up room. Um, and then they got suited up. They went to the launch pad and then that's where my access ended for, for the crew. So, they went up the tower, I left, and I went to the press site for a bit, and then I went up to the VAB roof where, um, oh, great little anecdote here is because of that orange rocket in the VAB, you cannot have radio frequency transmitting devices around it um, because there's very large solid rockets. And I can see the, I can see Chris's face. He just made a face that he understands where I'm going with this. So. I could not bring my phone. I had no SA situational awareness on the countdown. If it was going, anything, nothing. And I don't want to. I don't want to complain because it's obviously a remarkable privilege to be up on the roof for a launch like this. But I had no clue the status of my friends. Right? Not even talking about like, is this launch happening? Like my friends and their safety. Screw my photos. I needed to know the status of my friends, and that was brutal, like like brutal. Um, and there was a moment where we, someone had a stopwatch, which was or some some pocket watch, which was wrong. 
and we heard the 60 second press like we heard it with our ears there's there's some sort of vent or press around 60 seconds we heard that audibly and the person called out 802 and i knew that the launch was 80256 but it was like well into 802 and it wasn't launching and i'm like oh man um and that you know obviously i'm not going to like start packing up i was i was ready um to shoot but that that like 50 seconds from what i thought was an abort from a trip sensor because like this is the first commercial mission civilian mission they're going to be ultra safe it's like extra extra careful to lift off was like the longest minute of my life and it was such a relief when they launched because the weather the next day at launch time it was raining at least where mm -hmm. i was near the cape mm -hmm. um and and that was that was their day to to launch was was wednesday september 15th in in my view speaking as how i interpreted the data it that was their day to launch um because because another part of this mission is because they weren't going to the space station and they were coming back in three days they need to know weather was good at the splashdown points. When you're at the station for six months, you can like wait an extra couple of days for there to be good splashdown weather. You can't do that when you have a like constrained free flyer mission. So then they they launch, they very clearly make it to second stage ignition. The the booster at this point, which I guess the booster doesn't matter, but the booster is re-entering. I see second stage, it goes behind a cloud, I stop my exposure, something like that. And I'm thinking like, you know, normally if this was a normal launch, my first focus is like, I need my photos on the internet now because this is my job and photos need to get out because like, this is a newsworthy event. I did not care an ounce about my photos. I needed to know that they were like safely in orbit, like, because they're people I truly care about. Um, and the worst part was, and I, I know my tone is getting angry, but we got <sighs> locked on the VAB roof because someone forgot a key and we, we were up there for much longer than I wanted to be. And I was starting to get really, really antsy. Um, and I, and I, you know, like I knew deep down, like they're fine. Um, someone probably could have gotten us information where something to have gone wrong, but like I needed to know that they were fine. And like, as soon as someone got a phone, as we exited the VAB, like one of the escorts, like I was handing them, I'm like, you need to pull up Twitter for me right now. And like, can we like pull up the webcast to see that like they're still coasting or whatever. And, you know, luck, luckily they were fine and then made it back to the press site, got my phone yeah. and, and started to get my pictures out. But um, that was really stressful and and the, the photos were worth it. But I'd probably reconsider watching a launch of that magnitude without comms, <clears throat> without right. comms. So um, <laughs> well, it, and, it, it was and, hard. It was hard. And, and, and I know you've said it, but I mean, it, like it there is a proof i mean i mean watching crew in general and watching people just in general launch on rockets is nerve-wracking especially when you know mm -hmm. what's happening and you know what the vehicles yeah. are and you know the risk but man like i i know what you mean john like it is a totally another level when you know one of the people on that rocket yeah let alone four of them. <laughs> yeah, let alone the, all like, of them. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. And 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 what's what's hard to verbalize, right? Is like these guys. Are they like my best friends ever? Like, no. Are they my best friends? Yeah. Are they people that I've known for my whole life? No. But the bond that I've formed merely by working with them so closely and and mere proximity, like it's different than than anything I've ever experienced. So, you know, of course, it's like they have their families, you know, their, their, their blood, their families, they've known their whole lives, but um, they meant a lot to me too. Like just because of the time I've spent with them um, over the last six months. And, and, and another thing is like, I may, I'm lucky to be a public facing member of a very extensive, mostly behind the scenes team. There's many people that can say the same thing about how much they care about the crew. Um, they just aren't in a position where like they're, they're creating content about the mission that, that gets out there. Um, and, and I don't know if you have it on hand right now, but like they, they showed to me that friendship with a video they made on orbit. I was going to um, go there if you didn't, John. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so there is a video um, from orbit that I think Michael, you should queue up right about now. <laughs> yeah. Good timing. Um, so th there are actually two videos and, and when I was disseminating all this content, I saw the thumbnail of one of them and it was a picture of me and the four crew members that Jared took up in his personal cargo. 
and and not that he initiated that i i asked <laughs> but it, it ended up going in his cargo and there was a video on his phone with that picture as a thumbnail and as i'm like scrolling through getting all this stuff onto a computer i'm like whoa like that's me like i gotta watch this like surely he'd be okay if i watched it because it because it's me and i watched it and and i haven't posted this one publicly yet but there's a there's a video that jared took of like my photo by the smaller window and he like he's talking about it and he's like thanks for all the cool pictures and then he pans up to the other crew they all wave and he like tosses the phone to haley and like haley gave me a quick tour of the cupola um i haven't posted mm -hmm. that one maybe because i mentioned it publicly people are going to start begging for it and i will do that <laughs> but um the the one that um we did post and i'm sure you have it ready um if you have it ready i guess you can just play it um do you have audio with it yeah, i don't know if do we have the audio on this hey, michael Sam. i'm not sure but um, Dragon. I don't think we do. I don't but. think so. We just to say but um, it, anyway, it's just a video they made. But also, thank you for all the support, talking and, and the thanking me for the friendship and the work and, you know, Jared's like out of frame, like floating around and stuff. Um. Anyway, so so this yep. one I stop didn't talking. Know. They can hear us. Oh, stream can hear That's right. We're trying. Can't wait to show you. See you, bro. Hey, Snap. Greetings from Crew Dragon. Hey, Snap. <laughs> um, we just wanted to say that we miss you, but also thank you for all the support, all the love and encouragement over the last few months, and of course, all the badass photos. Um, we're thinking of you and can't wait to see you soon. Yep, we're taking lots of pictures. Yep. That is very they cool. They're not quite up to Snap quality, but we're getting there. That's yep. right. We're trying. <laughs> can't wait to show you. See you, bro. So a message from Orbit it's over there, John. Yeah. So, uh, so that, that one I saw, I saw that one after that first one. So like I saw the first one, I offloaded it. And then because like there were a lot of videos that kind of from a thumbnail perspective just look like that, like I, did, I wasn't going to watch their personal content. Like I was just in charge of offloading it. Um, and then I think like out of nowhere, Tuesday or I don't know, whatever day I posted it, like Jared just texted me that video with, with like no caption. And I was like, whoa, like they all took the time to make me a personal video, which was like really cool. And, and you know, not, not to like inflate myself too much. Like obviously they did that for many people, right? Like there's, there's a lot of videos I've seen our team posting of like, they took up a patch for someone else and made a video, but like just, just for like me to have that like means a lot and really sums up the, the rapport and friendship I've built with, with them. So really cool to, cool to see that. That is really cool. And while they were in orbit, what I mean, what were you doing during the flight? Was there work to be doing while they were on orbit? Were you just kind of hanging out, checking in? Did you interact um, with the crew? Well, I was about to say something really snarky about being angry about the comms blackout, but I think <laughs> we we got we got past that. Um, I will address it though. So so the first day, like there wasn't really any communication from from Dragon to like the public. And and that's that's because like there were dedicated opportunities for long form video based on multiple space assets, ground assets, whatever they are. And there was a hierarchy to there. There was a St. Jude live event. Uh, they rung the bell on the New York Stock Exchange and then they did a public event. And, you know, ultimately, and I, I should have mentioned this way sooner and way more extensively. But um, this this was a 200 million dollar fundraising initiative for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And a big part of that was doing a live on orbit event with patients where they they just chatted with patients. And and one of those live video opportunities went to that before it went to the public. And, you know, by the second day, they did do a public event. But um, there was there was like this very disappointing expectation of of content from from the general public that, um, you know, I, I put a couple of statements out when I when I saw it get a little out of hand. But like, you know, this is a private mission. and. I think we're entering a, a time in human space flight where we're not going to get public domain 24 seven access right. to astronauts like we did with NASA. And I think that's something that we'll have to live with and understand and work around. But um, long story short, they did do a public live event eventually <laughs> really calmed some people, which was good. Um, it was great to see, but, but for me during the, the flight, um, the first day was like, had to wake up super early to pick up my remote cameras and then like had the zero G flight had some more work to do with like offloading some of my own personal content and stuff from the launch. Um, 
so so the first day was was pretty swamped and and whatnot and then the second day i was um with, without saying too much i i did have a lot more awareness by the second day on what was going on i was i was able to get myself in a position where i could you know be in the loop on a lot more which which was great um and and third day was the same case and you know by the end of that third day or whatever you know by the time splashdown came i i got myself in a position to see splashdown from a elevated vantage point near this on the space coast um ultimately didn't see it but again heard that call out that the mains deployed felt great and then went to meet up with the families where we then went to welcome them back at the the show landing facility very cool um mentioning the the fundraising efforts which of course is the entire point of the mission and that's not even done yet they've met their 200 million goal uh thanks to a 50 million contribution from elon musk but they, they're continuing on i think they're, they're going until uh next february so it'll be a full year since the mission was announced uh, to keep fundraising in john i think you're doing something cool uh hopefully to keep going with that so we'll, we'll when that that's coming soon right we'll, we'll stay tuned for that yeah yeah, basically, it, I, I talked about it publicly, but it's not yet ready from like an impl implementation standpoint. But, um, you know, prior to now, I hadn't been selling prints from this mission because like it's it's for higher work. It's for a client like they're they're free to use in news media. But I talked to Jared the other day and we are going to offer prints via my personal website, via that gallery. And every month, you know, until people stop buying them, I am when I get that payout from Smug Mug. I'm going to look at how much of it came from Inspiration4 print sales, and I'm going to donate all that straight to St. Jude. So that was a long-winded way of saying, if you buy prints of i4 through my site, you will directly support St. Jude with those profits, and you'll get some cool prints. And then I'm sure um, as we get closer to the actual in-person auction in a couple months, we'll do some you know, higher quality signed, framed, matted prints and stuff for the auction. Um, so that, that'll be cool. Awesome. We'll keep, well, and we're going to share that as soon as that's out. That'll be on johncrossphotos.com. Got to plug Mr. Cross's gallery, which of course has a lot of other cool rocket photos. And since he's on, we should share that. Um, but stand by for some extra cool inspiration for stuff. That'll be for St. Jude. Um, obviously we did a lot of our own fundraising on our launch stream. Thank you again to everyone who contributed to that. If you contributed to the inspiration for fundraiser, like at all, a big thanks from everyone here because that's just i mean that was the whole purpose of everything um so a big thank you to that talking about some of the photos taken on this on this mission do you have a personal favorite photo that the crew took mm. while they were in space or on the mission no just because like i haven't really looked at all of it in detail enough and and another part of it is like it's not my content so i don't know if it's like my place to be like this is the best photo um, and, and as we start getting like the professional camera Nikon photos out to the world, and, and that's going to take a bit longer for reasons I don't think we have time to, to get into, but um, I'm not going to inject my own subjective editing style into those images. I will help process them from a raw format that needs editing to a, you know, lightly spiced up product, but I'm not going to like make them john cross edits i don't think that's my place but um you know i'm, I'm sure like as time goes on they're going to post some some great stuff and oh one that comes to mind is, mm -hmm. is Haley last night posted a picture of her holding a picture of her when she was going through her cancer treatment and what's really powerful about that photo michael if you pull it up it's on Haley's twitter um is that she's smiling in the photo of her with cancer and she's smiling in the photo where she's on top of the world the photo of her with cancer she's not crying she doesn't look sad. She like is smiling and like persevering through this. There it is, um, this this battle with cancer. And and look where it led her. She's literally on top of the world, um, and she's smiling. You know the same, if not more, now that she's on top of the planet. And I think we're gonna see a lot more stories like that. As as Jared put it, as this door opens through everyday people going to space, we're gonna see more stuff like this, and it's it's really cool. Do you have a favorite photo that you took over the course of the campaign or a favorite moment? Um, I'd have to like just scroll through the Flickr. One recent one that comes to mind is like the third photo down on the Flickr. There's a picture of the four crew visiting their, their Falcon 9 booster. And I, I had a cool tweet about this when I, when I reshared it from my 4s account. Um, 
these people are forever changed, but they're still the same. So they just experienced something that 600 people, fewer than 600 people have ever experienced. And even fewer than that, if you count people who have, you know, reached orbital velocity, but that's a different conversation. But um, <laughs> these, these people, two days after screaming through the atmosphere in a capsule at, you know, however many degrees Celsius, uh, wearing spacesuits. Two days later, they came back and they're wearing street clothes, visiting the reusable rocket booster that launched them to space. Like, Jared says it's a lot. Like, no other company's doing that. And this is the first time that, like, everyday people have experienced that. And I just think this photo is so representative of, like, where this mission has kind of ended up, right? Like, they were they were in street clothes in March. They started training, they got their spacesuits, they went to space, they came back, and now they're in street clothes again. And and they visited the rocket that put them there. So, so that's a recent favorite. Um, it, it's really hard to nail down. I mean, like this jellyfish photo with the sunrise and whatnot, that one's great. I'm, I'm really glad that I got that one. Um, because going into this launch, like I, I spent so much time with the crew and there's so much training events that when I considered like, the broader end of mission portfolio, I would have been happy if I like performed average with this launch from a launch photo perspective, because there's so much other stuff with the crew and like post launch stuff and training that like, yeah, like if I got some serviceable photos of launch, like that'd be great. But I'm really proud of like, you know, taking advantage of this like dusk launch with, with the rocket, like briefly going into the sunlight. I'm really happy with what I got. And I hope those images like help tell the story for history i know from my perspective the launch itself was exceptionally beautiful it was a you know picture perfect clear night i had a that backlit jellyfish effect going on um so i think that was perfect and really couldn't have worked out any better especially even just launching at the beginning of the window all of that worked out so nicely for people watching the launch um and viewing it and then the splashdown there were some people that got shots of it coming down towards shoot deploy and stuff like that people in near the space center heard sonic booms on the way down which hadn't happened since the shuttle program well, oh, oh, that's not true. X-37B, yeah, I guess, well, kind of counts. But Well, for a crew landing, crew. though, it's the first But for time. a crew landing, yeah. right. Um, yeah, so, this was the first crewed dragon to come back to the Atlantic. Right, because it, it was going to the Gulf. And, uh, of course, I think me and Chris up in Daytona were selfishly hoping for that Daytona landing zone. But uh, that'll happen. <laughs> that'll have to come at a later time. Um, mm -hmm. But either way, I think from that perspective, I think a lot of that worked out really, really nicely. And a lot of people got to see some part of the mission um, or experience it in that way. And I, I, mm -hmm. that was just super cool and very important to the, the goal of the mission, which was to raise awareness about this stuff. Yeah, I was totally wrong. And like I was telling people, like, don't expect it to do that crazy pre-sunrise jellyfish right. thing. We were and saying then that Declan too. from Flight yeah. Club. <laughs> Declan, Declan from Flight Club, he's like really up ramp, like ramped up his his efforts and like visualizing this stuff beyond just the the data of it. And he he put out something that was like, yeah, it, it's going to briefly like arc into an orbital sunrise for a couple minutes, and it did. And I was amazed. Um, and and that's how I was kind of in position to get that photo uh, with the jellyfish. Um, you know, just looking back as I go further into the gallery, like the fighter jet photos. Um, over the pad are like obviously really cool. Um, yeah. Through this campaign, I got to do air to air photography. So um, I am not on a boat with a tall tripod. I am in another <laughs> plane. Um, so, so Michael, I think you went back to Bozeman there, but if you can scroll up even closer to launch, um, we did a practice flyover a couple of days before, and then we did a real flyover with the rocket vertical on the pad. Oh yeah. And we did, we did a flight over Starbase too, which was really cool. Um, but, but a couple days before launch, we did a, a flyover with, with uh, six jets and another jet, the photo ship, which was me. Um, and, and, and what was really helpful, and, and as we wrap up here, I, I mean, do we have a, a couple more minutes? I know we're... Yeah, we have like, a couple like more we minutes. Two, we're but, we're but, going to around okay, five-ish. Okay. No cool. hard limit or anything. Got it. But. Yeah. So, so, so one thing that was really great with this is I got to work with a lot of proven leaders uh, in like the space and aviation industry. And one of them, you know, I, I talked about Kid Poteet mission manager but like one of the other mission managers is uh leif erickson uh mm -hmm. todd leif erickson mm -hmm. um we don't have to get into like his space history if um but like he's, he's been around the space but industry, he has but his yes. background is yes his his background is as of um like an f-16 experimental test pilot so he is 
the most consummate professional in like um, coming out of a situation and craftfully, respectfully, constructively telling people how they can improve. And after our practice flight a couple of days before, uh, I sat him down when we had some time and I said like, hey, I want you to just grill me on you. You've seen a lot of jet flights. You've done a lot of photo shoot flights. Give me the most nuanced, critical feedback on how when we do this on the real day that I can do it better. And he did. And he did it in a way that didn't make me feel like a piece of crap. And he did it in a way that was digestible for someone who had done like four air air shoots ever. And I think if you look at the practice flyover photos and then you look at the real flyover photos a few days later with the rocket vertical on the pad, like I think they are demonstrably better. Now we did have better light on the real photo day, but like relative to like the positioning of myself relative to the other jets, um, I think we nailed it. And that's a testament to my photo pilot. Uh, Philip goes by Sniggy. He was my, my photo pilot for both flights. And, and he was super responsive at getting me in the right spots where I need to go. You know, I'm going up, 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 knife edge, knife edge, knife edge, left, right, you know, whatever trying to get us in the optimal position because I'm seeing that shot coming and and you can't just hold that shot for like 10 right. seconds. Like you have to time <laughs> it really well. And, and again, like I'll leave it to the viewers to ultimately um, decide, but I think the flyover photos with the rocket on the pad, the second one are way better than the ones from practice day. Um, and that's just a testament to, I was surrounded by a lot of oh. very experienced people in many industries that, that enabled me to do what I was able to do through this mission. So we'll get Michael Flickr Pro real quick, but <laughs> oh, we we don't even have Flickr Pro. I run the Flickr. <laughs> <laughs> but these shots were awesome. I always love the crossover between jets and rockets, and when there's flyovers from like NASA T thirty eight or like if there's fighter jets over at Patrick Space Force Base, sometimes they'll fly over the launch pads. And But then like this, a whole formation, and knowing that some of those are being flown by astronauts that are about to launch on that rocket, super cool, mm -hmm. and the photos were awesome. These are so, I think these are some of my favorite photos from the whole campaign. Thanks. But uh, I think we are yeah, coming it was, up uh, close fun. Yeah, com coming up close to the end of our time here. We know we were running late because of certain things in Boca Chica because that, that just kind of is how Boca Chica is. But, uh, John, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and just telling us everything about Inspiration4 from a photography standpoint. It was super, super cool to watch. Thanks for having me. And, and if we could, like, spend one more minute, it'd be really cool to pull up the graphic of um... – like the stats of my photos and I can just really briefly run through it. If people want to like go back and pause and, and look at the specifics, do we have, do we have time for that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, I went through the Lightroom catalog, um, and I pulled this data. I'll preface with, I'll preface it with, it's not a hundred percent accurate because, you know, some photos were from other team members that I was just tasked with, with cataloging. Um, but, but most of it is like, pretty much accurate. So if you're curious at all about like the lenses I was using or the camera bodies I was using or the settings I'm using, uh, Michael, if you could just like scroll real quick so they can see the whole document, um, you know, screenshot it, digest it. If you have any questions, um, message me, I'd be happy to, to answer anything, you know, privately when I have the time. But um, this, this journey for me was like a big entry into mirrorless cameras, which, um, Life advice, don't be afraid to like try something that kind of scares you or you have preconceived notions of because I was so against mirrorless cameras and then I was kind of voluntold to get one because they're quieter and there's going to be a lot of audio recording and I, I did um, and, and it worked out and now like I'm really embracing mirrorless but, but uh, that's all I got. Um, thank you guys for having me. It was really fun. I'm, I'm so excited that I got to be a part of this. Um, and I, again, I still don't really think I get what it all means. So that's all I got. It was awesome. It was awesome to hear about the mission. It was awesome to follow your photography over the whole thing. And just thanks for coming and hanging out as always. Obviously, you're no stranger to NSF Live. Love having you on, but just thanks for hanging out. Uh, Chris G., thanks for hanging out with us as well. Always appreciate you. It was it was my pleasure. I feel like I just sat here for an hour and a half and listened to you talk, John, and it was amazing. <laughs> uh Sorry, I know there are many, many more stories <laughs> you, you want to tell, but uh, but no, my my absolute pleasure. And John, thank you for being on.
Of course, and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Michael, for working on the back end, and a big thank you to all of the support that comes our way, launch directors and flight engineers, especially all of our YouTube members. You guys are the ones that keep the lights on and keep us going, so appreciate all of the support, especially the super chats. Thank you if you just tossed a question our way, we appreciate that, and if you just tuned in and hung out for an hour and a half, we appreciate you, we appreciate you all the same. I uh, love hanging out every Saturday, but we are going to wrap up for this week. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Thomas Burkhart for NASA Spaceflight. We'll see you all next time.